Yay! Good, I'm gonna start with, with a few questions just to soften the audience up. And here in Sweden, you have three gold albums, one platinum album, amongst other awards, and your biggest hits, it's Touch Me, of course. Yes. But which song is your own favorite? Um, I guess, I love Touch Me because that made me an international star when I was very young, I was like 20, 21. Um, but I, I, I think my favorite song is a song called I Surrender to the Spirit of the Night. I love this song. And obviously the new songs that I'm writing are very good too. Coming very soon. <laughs> yeah, talking about songs, I know like during the 80s, you and Sabrina were like two of the biggest rivals. But a few years ago, the two of you recorded a song together, Call Me. Uh, how did you come up with that idea? Or did you choose that song because you were a big fan of Oblongi as a kid? Um, most definitely. Back in the 80s, um, the record companies, um, they thrive on publicity. The more publicity you have, they, they feel the more records you sell and the more publicity you get in the newspaper. And they created this war between us. But it was never real, you know. Because every time we met each other, we'd go, Hi Sabrina, I'd go, Hi Sabrina, she'd go, Hi Sam. And then about six years ago, we were working in, um, in Poland at the Sopot Festival. And we hadn't seen each other since Ibiza, which was like maybe 10 years before. And we were talking about our, our influences when we were younger. And mine was definitely Debbie Harry from Blondie. She was like my idol. And she said, oh, she's mine too. And on the aeroplane, we discussed which song Maybe, oh yeah, that was it. We said, uh, why don't we do a song together? And uh, we chose Call Me because we both love Debbie Harry. And we said, Call Me because nobody calls anybody anymore. Everybody texts or emails. And uh, it's just such a great track. And that was like four or five years ago. And it's still playing in the clubs. It's still doing well. And even now, we do many shows together. And uh, she's a lovely girl, a lovely, lovely girl. That is awesome. I know that some of your songs uh, have been used in different movies, like Terrell Elm Street 5 with Robert Englund and Burglar with Whoopi Goldberg. Have Wall these, Street. Yeah. Uh, have, have these songs been, been written for a specific film, or has the film choose the pre-recorded song? Um, sorry. Let me think. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street was particularly done for this movie because I was working in Los Angeles doing lots of promotion and I, I met Robert England, I, you know, a scary man, Friday the 13th, and I said, uh, you sound so English. He said, yes, Samantha, I'm from London. So straight away we got a good relationship, we were good friends, and then he said, why didn't you do a song for the movie? So um, I telephoned England, we talked about it, and then I did a song called Now I Lay Me Down, and he went on the movie, and I actually watched about, I would say, two hours of the movie being shot in Universal Studios, and even watching the movie being shot was very scary. But Robert is a fantastic guy. I know that some people have met Robert here, and um, he's a very lovely man, yeah. Um, but I've also written songs for movies too. Um, I have a movie coming out, my own movie, um, which is called Seven Cases which will be out um, hopefully late summer. It's uh, only five people in the movie, uh, starring Stephen Berghoff, and uh, it's a thriller, very gory kind of film. Um, obviously, I won't tell you too much what it's about, but I think you'll like it. It's really good. So I've written some songs for that movie, and then um, there's a couple of more movies coming out, and I've written the uh, theme music for that as well. So yeah, this is why I love the music business, because you never stop learning or progressing, whether it's singing, producing, writing. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great career. Yeah, talking about career, you had like the mega hit, Touch Me, of course, and you've been in several films, and you've been in, on posters. So what do you prefer being recognized as, singer, model, or actor? Um, the main thing I've been doing since 1986 is singing. Um, obviously everybody remembers Touch Me, but there's songs like Nothing's Gonna Stop Me Now, I Only Want To Be With You, Do You Do Ya, um, I Surrender, True Devotion. 
But I guess every artist has their signature song. I would guess if you talk about Madonna, you think like a virgin. Rolling Stones, Satisfaction. Samantha Fox, touch me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm now recording my 10th album, my 10th studio album, which will be released at Christmas. Yeah. So yeah, I love singing. What can I say? It's, uh, I also love meeting my fans, and this is why I love doing these kind of conventions, because I get to talk to my fans and realize what kind of songs they like and what they want from me, what they like to hear live. And uh, it kind of keeps me going, you know, when I meet you lovely people. Thank you for coming. Yeah, talking about meeting fans, I know that you perform in India for over 17,000 people three nights in a row. And that broke the previous record by Bruce Springsteen. I know, that was amazing. Um, I remember going to my local news agent in London and it was run by an Indian family and every day I'll go and get my newspaper, my milk and my bread and uh, the Indian said, oh Samantha, you're very big in India and I was like, really? Oh my god. So I told my manager to ring some promoters in India and I arrived and it was like, wow, I felt like the Beatles. It was like, I was very emotional. There must have been like, I don't know, 10,000 people at the airport and then they said, we're now going to go for the sound check. And they drove us onto Gandhi Stadium, which is a massive cricket pitch. And we didn't have the, um, the equipment to perform for 70,000 people. So Jeffro Toll was performing the night before in a, a big stadium. And he very kindly lent me lots of his PA equipment. Because I needed big speakers. I needed video screens because it was such a huge place. So we did three nights in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, um, two nights in Delhi, Madras, and then I got an award from Mother Teresa, uh, being the most Western, um, the most influential Western female, which is quite amazing. Yeah. There is amazing, I would say. And talking about singing down in, in that region, I know you actually have been banned from performing in Malaysia. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, it was during um, my Asian tour and the first song of my show was called Sex on His Mind, which I'm sure we all have on our mind, right? Many times in the day, but I think men more, right? Maybe? <laughs> um, so I opened the show with Sex on His Mind, like this, and straight away they, they cut the show. As soon as I said the word sex, it was like, oh. So the next night I had to sing, love on his mind, like this. And then the last night I just went, sex! And then, <laughs> and then the government, they said, uh, you can never ever come back to this country and sing again. Maybe they forget me now where I go back. <laughs> Maybe I dye my hair or something. <laughs> but you know, this is why I'm writing my book at the moment, because I have such a... A great story of my life and it's been over 30 years in this business so I have much to talk about so expect an autobiography very soon. Do we have any questions from the audience and now we're running around? Yeah, over there. Hello everybody, I'm Dimitris from Greece. I'm a huge fan of Sam. Hello Dimitris. Hello Sam. So I would like to ask you, uh, definitely you are a huge icon for for many, many years and all over the world. So, uh, you gave us so many hits and uh, definitely the fans are expecting your new sound. So, regarding the new album, so uh, would you give us some more information about which is the sound now you're gonna uh, adopt for the new album? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dimitris. Great question and thank you for coming. You came from Greece. Thank you so much. Um, the new album, I believe, I've been doing a lot, a lot of 80s revival shows. And uh, I can see many young people, they do love the 80s music. So I'm going to combine the 80s sound with a modern twist, obviously. And I'm just working at the moment with Kim Wilde's brother, Ricky Wilde, who wrote Kids in America and 
uh, View From A Bridge, and all, all Kim's hits. He wrote many hits for Britney Spears back in the 90s. And I've just done a track with Steve Strange, unfortunately, you know, Visage. Um, Fade to Grey was one of my favourite songs back in the 80s. And I got a chance to work with him and wrote a song. And very sadly, a few months ago, he died. Um, I'm also working with Ian Masterson, who's wrote lots of songs with Barana Rama and Rick Astley and many, many 80s stars. So it's going to have those 80s sounds, but modern today. So great choruses, great melodies. Um, but always I love to use live, live instruments too. I love dance music, I love rock music, and I like to combine the two. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be very exciting. I've also, I'm writing a song at the moment with Boy George. Um, wow. Yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah. Talking about all these music artists, what music artists have you, have you always wanted to work with, but you haven't had the opportunity to work with yet? Um, well, I remember when I was 20, I met Lemmy from Motorhead. Some of you probably saw some pictures on my table. And, uh, yeah, I've always been very much a frustrated rock, rock, rock star, you know. But my record company, they wanted to be more, more disco. So whenever I did a song, even with Stott Aiken and Walkman, they never used live guitars, but I made them lose. Please, you must put guitar, please. And um, I guess my favourite... What was you saying about Lemmy? What was I going to tell you a story? It was going to be a secret. What was it now? Oh, yeah. We wrote a fantastic song together. And um, it was never released because he was in litigation with his record company for five years. But I hope one day this song will resurface and become a single because I think it's very different someone like Samantha Fox and Lemmy together. It's, uh, I don't know, it's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> Something for everybody. <laughs> yeah, we have a question over there. I'm going to be running down to the gentleman. Oh, he changed his mind. He's shy, don't be shy. <laughs> Have any other questions or yeah, over there. Hi there. Hi. I met you before. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah, Hello. my name is John. Yeah, uh, uh, I've been here since yesterday. Almost left over. Um, now I was going to ask you about uh, Stock Aitken Waterman because I know that um, you must feel very sort of lucky to be able to work with them anyway because they had a huge impact. Oh so, yeah. I mean, yeah. And I think that uh, probably nothing's going to stop you now. Must have sold. Almost as much as touch me. I mean, a few people know. I'm not quite. Okay, not quite. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think it's a sort of a you know, people don't think of it as big as it probably were. I mean, I think it must have been huge. No, it was a very huge song for me. Um, sorry. But when I released it, it was huge all over Europe. But it didn't make it in America because they weren't ready for the sound yet. Um, and then it wasn't until Rick Astley they started to kind of play Stott Aiken and Warman. Um, but it wasn't my biggest hit in Asia or America. But in Europe, it was a very, very big song for me. Very big. I mean, I love this song because it brings back so many memories of my life at this time was like a roller coaster. And yeah, nothing was going to stop me now. And still not, hopefully. <laughs> but could you just tell us a few details of what it was like to work with them? With Stock Aiken and um, like it was it very quick, in actual fact. I remember um, Nothing's Gonna Stop Me Now was written in 15 minutes. I arrived in the studio and I had a big success at that time with Touch Me and Do You Do You and I Surrender. And um, the record company felt like a change of direction. This is why I put guitar solo in Nothing's Gonna Stop Me Now because I had my sound and I didn't want to come away from that. Um, but it was always very quick. They were so very talented. They were a team. Um, and I remember going in the studio and Mike Stock saying, I think nothing's going to stop you now. And I said, wow, that's a great title for a song. And he wrote it in 15 minutes and I recorded it in one and a half hours. So I liked to work with them. It was fantastic. It was like, yes, yes, yes. I think the longer you take to do a song, 
then you think, when I do this live, it's got to be just like the single. Why make the, why make the record so complicated with all these harmonies and, um, uh, I don't know, in those days they used to slow things down, speed things up, and I wanted my songs to be natural so that when I went live, they sounded like the record. Um, so, yeah, no, they were very good, very professional, and me and Pete are still good friends, and Mike Stock has a very small label at the moment, and he wants to do a new song for the album too, so as the album's going to be a very 80s influenced album, I think I probably work with Mike Stock again. He's a very good lyricist, very, very good. Thank you. Yeah, talking about singing, I know you started singing at a very early age, like the age of five, and I know they went to theater school, and at the age of 14, you started your first band. Did you ever consider taking an order at day job? <laughs> I, I did. Uh, my mother and father um, always taught me uh, the value of life, and if I needed something, or I wanted a new leather jacket, or I wanted this, or go to a concert, that I had to work for it. Um, so yeah, the, the value of working and earning and I, I just knew if I wanted to buy that leather jacket, I'd have to earn the money to buy that. And I would knock on people's doors, I'd wash cars. Um, even my dad, if I say, Dad, can I have 10 pounds, please? He'd say, you can wash my car for one week. I'd go, okay. <laughs> so I learned the value of money because I come from a very working class family. And deep down in my heart, I still consider myself that person. And I think that's why I'm still in the business after all these years because this fox ain't no diva. <laughs> yeah, that's worth an applause. Uh, talking about work, I heard, you, I heard you've been working for Saving Wild Tigers. What, what drew you to that? Um, to be honest, I try to save so much in this world. Um, the tiger thing came when I watched a documentary and I couldn't believe there was only 2,500 less left in the wild. And then I started to investigate this and uh, discovered in China, they killed the tiger because they think the bones are good for epilepsy, or they make wine out of this because they think uh, the man, it makes them... <laughs> I won't do it, but you know what I mean? Um, and the whiskers they use for toothache and scientifically this is proven that this is rubbish. So I went on a politics show in England and met Jeremy Brown who is our foreign minister and showed him lots of pictures of what's going on in China. And then it went on from there and then it went on to about saving the dolphins in the cove in Japan. Because I think when you're a worldwide known person like me, um, I can help this situation because I have a voice and I can, like now, I can uh, help save people, help save animals. Um, we're only on this world once and we must do what we can, you know? Yeah, that's totally worth our bar. And we can talk about the, we can talk about the elephants, the rhino horn, and one day there's just going to be nothing, just zoos that children go to and not see wildlife programs anymore with animals in their real environment, you know, which is a shame. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, going back to your career, if no one else has a question because we are almost rounding up. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take Hello. that. Uh, what's the name of the new record? The new album? Um, I have a few different titles. Um, I'm thinking at the moment I'd like to call it Forever because I believe whether in this life or another life that will be around forever and uh, I believe in eternity and I believe in this is why I have this this means uh, I'm going to be forever in this life whether it's in this life, another life um, and uh, Hopefully, you'll still want to listen to Samantha Fox forever. <laughs> Hopefully. I have a question. And okay. uh, what time do you plan to take a concert in Sweden, here in Stockholm? 
Um, yeah, I have a, a concert on the 22nd in the Ericsson Globe. Um, do the David Hasselhoff tour. We did 10 shows last year. It's a fantastic show. Um, everybody gets to hear their favorite songs from when they're growing up. Everybody does their big hits. And um, that's the next show. Um, but before then, I go many other places. I'm always touring, I love touring. It's my favorite thing, is actually being on stage and seeing the people's faces and the fact I make people happy. And I believe that's why I'm here, to make people happy, you know, not sad. <laughs> yeah, I know that when you started modeling, you were expelled from school. Uh, a few years later, the principal, who went by the name Mr. Fox, by the way, yes. <laughs> asked you to promote the school. I know! Could you believe that? Um, yeah, I was in, in the sixth form. I just, my, my father made me stay on at school to get further education. Because all the time when I was a kid, I used to say, I'm going to be famous, I want to be a singer or an actress and this. And always practicing my autograph on my school books. And um, I remember the first time uh, I entered a competition. There was 20,000 girls and I just sent a picture in a bikini and uh, they chose me. And then I got a four year contract and it was like, mm, I think I, my lessons, I started getting bored with the lessons and just thinking about my life as a star. And this photographer took a picture of me and it went on the front page of the newspaper. And on the Monday I went to school and the headmaster said, I think you should go home. You're creating a disturbance with the first years. The first years loved it. You know, Samantha Fox, she's famous and in our school. So he called my parents into the school and he told me that I was expelled and I had to leave school, which was sad. Um, but then my career just went woof. And um, then two years later, because I did so well in my life, um, I was very, very famous straight away, 16, and overnight it, my life changed. And then two, yeah, two years later, he asked me to come back to the school and do a speech for all the parents and to say how great my school was and how they encouraged me and how they helped me. And I was like, no, nah. <laughs> no. Nah. Goodbye, Mr. Fox. It was very funny in the newspaper. It said, Mr. Fox sees red over Sam Fox pictures. And everybody thought it was my dad. But my headmaster was Mr. Fox. So it's quite confusing, really. But my teachers were nuns, and I went to a Catholic school, so I guess they were doing the right thing in the, you know, at the beginning. But then two years later, it was a bit hypocritical. Yeah. It sure is. Uh, and I even heard that you have a black belt in karate. Do you still do martial arts regularly? Do you want to try? Please not. <laughs> um, I do, I train. I train like three to four times a week. Um, I do kickboxing, boxing, swimming. Um, I love sports. I used to play in a, a girls football team when I was 14. Arsenal ladies. Anybody support Arsenal here? Yeah! Thank you, thank you. I know there's a West Ham support there. Boom! <laughs> yeah, so I've always loved sport, always. Always been very sporty. A bit of a tomboy. At Christmas I used to ask for football boots and um, uh, jeans and Fred Perry's. And my mother used to say, why don't you want dresses? And I think, no, nah, I like to play with the boys. It's much more fun. <laughs> Do you have any final questions? Because we really need to round up. Yeah. Hello. According, Hello. To, according to sports, what about the events last night when you stepped into the ring? I loved it. Last night, oh my God. Um, wrestling when I was a very small girl. It used to be on every Saturday morning. Um, it was only when we had like three channels, yeah? Back in the 70s, late 70s, 80s. And on a Saturday, we used to watch the wrestling with my grandparents and my grandmother, she loved it. She used to get her handbag, literally, and throw it at the TV like this. And I got a call from uh, uh, Ken. I don't know his second name. What was his second name? I don't know his second name. Um, 
obviously I don't live in Sweden, so I, I didn't know him very well, but I saw his picture and I thought, ooh, Ken is very nice. And uh, he asked me to come into the ring with him and uh, to touch me. And I said, how dare you come into the rings with my song, this is my song. Then he says, quite frankly, Samantha, you're too old. So I went up to him like this. And uh, he was very scared in case I went like this. <laughs> but it was an experience I've never done before and I'm one of those people who uh, I love to do new things, exciting things and things I've never done. Um, so yeah, it's another chapter for the book, what can I say? <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Tizen Tag. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, big applause for Samantha Box. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you, and thank you for coming, everybody. And hopefully, I'll see you in concert. Thank you.